So, uh, just incredibly quickly, the next few videos will be on current cruise missile technologies. I'll be discussing various countries' primary cruise missiles. To start off, I'll get straight to the point. Today I'm going to be talking about the Storm Shadow. So, Storm Shadow is an Anglo-French cruise missile manufactured currently by MDBA. The variant I'm going to be talk about, going to be talking about is mainly the British variant of Storm Shadow, so not the Scout. So Scout was developed earlier, sort of went into French service, uh, launches submunitions rather than has a warhead. It's a naval cruise missile that the French use. That's about it. Went into service in, I think, 1998 for the French. But in any case, <clears throat> today's going to be about more the British Storm Shadow. Anyway, it's a long-range, fire-and-forget, standoff missile cruise missile launched from an aircraft. So for the UK, that is either the Panavia Tornado or the Eurofighter Typhoon. Or potentially, it can be launched from other sort of countries' platforms. So uh, French Mirage, French Rafale, or the Swe Swedish Gripen. But that's neither here nor there. The, current, uh, the UK currently has 900 missiles. It was developed by the defense, French defense firm Mantra and the British defense firm British Aerospace, now BAE Systems, how they got incorporated. Uh, Storm Shadow, as I said, is fire and forget. Unfortunately, though, unlike some of its, you know, other perhaps more modern counterparts, like Tom Hawk, uh, once programmed, course cannot be changed. So the target cannot be changed once it's fired. But there is sort of a plan to change this under the Spear 4 program. So, Storm Shadow, as a lot of cruise missiles are, is built to strike high-value stationary assets. So that's large infrastructure, ports, compounds, caves. Effectively, any fixed valuable targets, it has deep penetration on those. So Storm Shadow uses a brooch warhead. Uh, brooch stands for British Royal Ordnance Augmented Charge Head. Um, and currently, accounting for inflation, the unit cost is probably near a million pounds, about 940,000, seeing as it was 790,000 pounds in 2011. In regard to the general specifications, it has a takeoff weight of 1,300 kilograms. 450 kilograms of that 1,300 is the broach warhead, so pretty potent warhead. It's 5.1 meters in length and 0 0.48 meters in diameter. So just to talk about the broach warhead for a minute, it's a pretty impressive thing, and it's pretty much world-renowned because of its penetrative power. So it was developed by BAE Systems, Global Combat System munitions, uh, Thales, missile electronics, and kinetic. So Broach uses a two-stage warhead, an initial sort of shaped charge which is designed to penetrate with sort of maximal power really, dig into the ground, and that cuts a passage through which the uh, secondary warhead follows. So this first uh, section of the warhead it can pierce through pretty much anything. Armour, concrete, the earth, rock, whatever it is, it pushes through. That creates this larger, uh, larger hole for the following warhead to penetrate further inside the target and then detonate using a variable delay fuse, which basically ensures maximum penetration and maximum damage to deep root targets. So generally, this does achieve a pretty impressive degree of hard hit penetration. It's really only seen elsewhere by laser guided gravity bombs like uh, like a paveway. The sort of massive penetrative technology means it's pretty much ideal uh, for use against the notorious caves and compounds in conflicts we've seen in the last sort of decade and a half in the war on terror. In regard to engine, 
it uses the Rolls-Royce Turbo Mecca Micro Turbo TRI-6030 Turbojet, uh, which is a pretty formidable engine, and of course it has quite a long endurance because the operational range, I believe, is 300 nautical miles. Uh, with a 3 meter wingspan, it can go pretty far. During its travel time, they call it low profile configuration. So what that basically means, all that means is it's sort of sea skimming. Uh, the same sort of concept, but over land. So it will fly pretty much as low as possible, 30 to 40 meters above any surface, uh, using sort of terrain tracking technology in order to stay as close to the ground as possible. And that avoids largely radar detection. Uh, and while it is cruising, it is a cruise missile, its maximum speed is a thousand kilometers per hour. So generally it's operational in operation, it will be going about 0 0.8 to 0 0.95 Mach, which again maximizes stealth because it's not supersonic. So this low profile configuration means it flies as close to the surface as possible, but before an impact, before it strikes its target to achieve maximum penetration, it climbs to a higher altitude. It sort of goes along as low as possible and then climbs incredibly high up. Uh, and it does this for a number of reasons. Apologies, there are seagulls in London for some reason. Uh, first off, it needs to achieve positive target identification, which it does using a thermographic camera with infrared homing. And also, you know, you want the best angle to maximize penetrative power. You don't have much uh, power if, let's say, the target's here and you're just going along and sort of that. That is a far better angle for penetrative power. Anyway, that also, you know, as we say, gravity as well. Gravity-guided bombs is uh, are generally used for these sort of functions if you're not using it in a standoff context. So gravity will help and give you more kinetic impact initially. So in regard to the thermographic camera it has on the front for target identification, sometimes it cannot identify the target, can't achieve lock, uh, or it will sort of take a view of the battle space and see that there is too much collateral damage or the mission, you know, it's not achievable properly anyway. At which point, the missile will fly to a crash point, so it can't be detonated mid-air, it can't be uh, sort of disposed of high up in the atmosphere, it can't change course. But what it will do is go to this crash point, and that's basically just committing missile suicide in a safe area. That's about it. But if it does achieve positive target identification, once the impact has been achieved and you know, it's damaged the target or hopefully destroyed it. The impact information can be sent back to the aircraft that launched it and the success of the strike can be evaluated without needing to visually observe ob observe uh, the area of impact. So you get effectively uh, information relays back to the plane and then that will be relayed back to whatever squadron it's within and then that will be relayed back to the RAF and then so on and so forth up the command chain. And so you really can evaluate the success um, of a target strike in a standoff manner. You don't have to get close, you don't have to actually go and check out the area. It really is a proper standoff weapon. So, for its navigation, it has to get where it needs to go. It uses in-flight identification that's sort of, you know, the infrared camera, uh, inertial GPS, uh, TERPROM guidance systems, and also terminal guidance. So its infrared system is DSMAC. So that's its infrared imaging system, which means it can use that to match terrain in order to maintain that low profile. It flies low, as we've said. So, in regard to the background of Storm Shadow, it was developed by Matra and British Aerospace, as we've said, uh, but 
there was also involvement with other firms. So Mc, McDonnell Douglas, uh, Tech, Texas Instruments, Short Brothers, Bofors, and uh, Raphael. So they're the ones who make uh, or help to produce the Raphael. Um, in any case, um, since its development, it's seen pretty extensive combat use. So the RAF launched, launched Storm Shadow via tornadoes in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. So despite the fact that they had not officially entered service yet, they were deployed. Uh, and this really gave Storm Shadow accelerated testing for a schedule. It really was a sort of trial by fire. So Storm Shadow pretty much emerged pretty well on the other side with a massive reputation because, as we've already said, its penetrative power is pretty much ideal for striking targets in the sort of war on terror era caves and compounds. Storm Shadow, I think, was then used again in the NATO intervention during the Libyan Civil War, in which it was used against pro-Gaddafi targets by uh, tornado squadrons. So I think that was the Al Jufra Air Base uh, and a military bunker deep rooted in Sirte. So in this conflict, it was reported by the British and I think the Italians that this missile had a 97% success rate. It really is quite potent and it is, you know, successful a lot of the time, nearly all of the time. 97% is pretty high considering that other cruise missiles, I think, have perhaps 94%. <clears throat> Since the NATO intervention, four Storm Shadow units were used in combat by the RAF against an ISIS bunker in Iraq, um, and all were direct hits with deep penetration, so it performed perfectly even when using four units simultaneously. And in 2018, I think the government used Storm Shadow missiles uh, launched from a tornado to strike a chemical weapons facility in Syria. So generally, they have been really associated with the Panavia tornado, but they've also been launched off a typhoon. So, I think the first and only use of Storm Shadow via Britain using the Typhoon uh, as a launch platform was in 2021, in which two Typhoons hit a cave complex in Iraq, which were both, again, ideal hits. So, I think, generally, Storm Shadow is pretty fascinating. Its penetrative power is something that's pretty much unrivaled, even by, you know, some of the best uh, laser guided gravity bombs. Storm Shadow has brilliant function. I'd say it fulfills its role pretty perfectly. It may not have the sort of range of America's Tomahawk. It may not have the superior speed of India's Brahmos, which, you know, that's pretty incredible innovation. And we'll talk about both of those at a later date. But particularly considering, particularly considering the sort of combat that Storm Shadow has seen, its penetrative power for complexes and caves has become massively valuable, and to an extent that is circumstantial. But the fact that, by nature of it being a cruise missile, Storm Shadow is a standoff missile, it makes it truly valuable uh, when considering that the only other alternatives are these laser-guided bombs for deep penetration. So generally, that's uh, paved way for if you're launching off of, let's say, a typhoon or tornado. Uh, but as we've said, it really does clearly fit into its role, and its historical use only really further proves that. And the world has really seen its sort of how potent it is. So we'll see if any real innovation actually takes place with Storm Shadow other than the ability to change this targeting information mid-flight, which is currently an ongoing program. So I'll update you on that at some point. But it is doubtful 
that Storm Shadow will continue to develop much after considering the new generation of strike aircraft. Uh, these strike fighters, they'll be accompanied by a new generation of cruise missiles. And, you know, that may mean that generally the missile's future is particularly uncertain. British forces also uh, attempt to, I guess, balance the sort of cruise missiles that they use. So it depends on what they see fit for the future of combat, but it may prove that, you know, more, more long-range uh, cruise missiles launched from ships, launched from uh, launch platforms in, I guess, battle hubs, uh, it may be superior within the future of warfare. We can't really know, but what we can say for the moment is that Storm Shadow does what it needs to do pretty ideally, and it's served its country really quite well. So we'll see what comes of it. Moral of the story is, you know, be a bit more like Storm Shadow. That's the end.